Uh, welcome everyone to the uh, regular board meeting of the Little East Lake Schools Board of Education here at 35353 Curtis Boulevard in East Lake, Ohio. Uh, Mr. Charnello, uh, will you call the roll? Dr. Beal? Here. Mr. Jones? Frozen. Give it a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Moore? Here. Here. Mr. Roskus? Here. Mrs. Here. Zern? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, next, we have the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Charnella, do we have any public comment? We do not. Next is the approval of the minutes. First, uh, approval for the minutes of October 12th, 2020. Do I hear a motion? Mr. President? Yes. I make a motion to approve the minutes from October 12th. Thank you, Mr. Marhar. Do I hear a second? Mr. Raskus? I'll second the motion. Thank you, Mr. Raskus. Is there any discussion? All right, that's a second. Okay. Uh, Mr. Charnello, will you call the roll? Mr. Jones? Mr. Murrah? Yes. Mr. Roskus? Yes. Mrs. Zurin? Yes. Dr. Beal? Yes. Passes 5 0. Yes. Next, the, uh, to approve the minutes of October 22nd, 2020. Do I hear a motion? Mr. President? Yes, Ms. Zurin. I will approve the minutes of October 22nd, 2020. Thank you, Mrs. Zurin. Do I hear a second? Mr. Murrah? Second it. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Chainala? Mr. Jones? Mr. Murrah? Yes. Mr. Raskus? Yes. Mrs. Ern? Yes. yes. Dr. Beal? Yes. Fest is 5 0. The next item on the agenda, item three, is the treasurer's report. Mr. Chainala? All right. Letter A, we have the Financial report for the month ending October 31st, 2020. This report now ties with the five-year forecast, which you will see on letter C of this item or agenda. Letter B is the amended appropriations. These are also to tie the general fund to the five-year forecast. Also, we did get some carryover funds for federal dollars, so that's why you will see some of those numbers increasing as well. Great. Nick, can you just talk briefly in item B is our CARES Act money. Can It's like on your first, second page in, just inform the board of how much we've gotten and approximately how much we're, well, well I know we expect to spend between 3.5 to 4 million, mm -hmm. but can you update them on how much we've actually gotten in CARES Act money? What, I'm, what I want the public to know is we have our additional expenditures, but there's a lot of people think that it CARES Act money covers all of our expenses. Can you speak to that? Yeah, we've uh, received about between 1.4 and 1.5 million dollars in CARES Act funding. Um, yeah, to cover a, and uh, to cover uh, expenses that are above and beyond that, um, especially with deadlines. Um, some of the CARES Act funds need to be spent by this December. And then others can carry over a little further, but we're expending a lot more money than uh, what we're being received in aid. Thank you. Okay. Um, letter C, the five-year forecast report. Some of the key items here to note. Uh, we did, it is factoring in the new money issue from April, so I want to say thank you to the community for that one. And then also, um, it also has 0% raises throughout the forecast. So that those are two key points I just wanted to point out there in the five-year forecast. And, you know, there's been a lot of rumor or talk in the community that um, I think maybe as they see the number of COVID cases, perhaps that'll diminish, but that the school district wants to close the school district so we can lay people off and save money. So your five-year forecast 
which has us making payroll, no cash advances, has us fiscally solvent for three more years. Is that, did you build in layoffs of personnel into that five-year forecast? No. So we're solvent without layoffs. Yes. So the rumor that we want to lay people off because of our five-year forecast is not based in fact. Okay. And that is up for your consideration. Okay. Uh, that is not part of the consent agenda. So I'm looking for a motion to approve uh, item 3C, the five-year forecast. Mr. President, yes, Mr. Oskus. motion to approve item 3C, five-year forecast. Thank you, Mr. Oskus. Do I hear a second? Mr. President. Mr. Merhar? I'll second the motion. Thank you, Mr. Merhar. Do I hear any discussion? Uh, Mr. Charnell, that also does not factor in any renewals passing, correct? Correct. It's further down on the five-year forecast, um, but no, they are, they're never assumed to pass. Okay. Thank you. But the, but the, but the final number you are looking at right. Is, is predicated on those renewals passing. Yeah. Right. Okay. Any other discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Trinell? Mr. Jones? Mr. Marar? Yes. Mr. Roskis? Yes. Mrs. Zurin? Yes. Dr. Beal? Yes. Passes 5 0. Mr. Trinell? Yes. Letter D, service agreement with the Lake Geauga Com Computer Association. This is for final forms. We already use final forms for athletics. This is just to get a consortium cooperative pricing. So it's just reducing our costs. Great. Do it. Go ahead. And by the way, Nick has done a outstanding job right from the beginning, coming in and finding ways for us to save dollars. And this is an example. He's done a really good job with that. Sure, it adds up. Uh, do I hear any? Uh, do I hear a motion to approve item 3D service agreement with Lake Geauga Computer Association? Mr. President. Yes, Mrs. Zern. I make the motion to approve item 3D service agreement with Lake Geauga Computer Association. Thank you, Mrs. Zern. Do I hear a second? Mr. Murray. I'll second the motion. Thank you, Mr. Hart. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Trinella? Mr. Jones? Mr. Murar? Yes. Mr. Roskis? Yes. Mrs. Zurn? Yes. Dr. Beal? Yes. Passes 5 0. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Trinella. Letter E, utility company invoices. This is with the Dominion company and their suppliers. For the past year or so, they have been charging us sales tax, and we have not been remitting the sales taxes. And then those unpaid sales taxes are incurring late fees to the point where they are now flagging our some of our buildings for shutoff. Uh, we reached out to our legal counsel. They have authored, they have recommended that we pay all of our invoices in full, avoid any disruption to our students in our buildings and then we will fight to get all of those back and get all the taxes and all the late fees back with legal assistance so but they would like your recommendation to do that so oh, well first um okay is there a motion to approve item 3e utility company invoices mr ruskis mr president i will make a motion to approve item 3e thank you Thank you, Mr. Raskus. Is there a second? Mr. Merhar? Thank <coughs> you. Uh, any discussion? Uh, Mr. Chanel, this is, um, we are not supposed to be paying sales tax, correct? Correct. So they've been charging us Dominion for something. Know this. Um, so you have Dominion, the distributor, and then you have the supplier, which is also Dominion. However, they're separated. Mm -hmm. So uh, the supplier has been charging a sales tax and just has not acknowledged that we are tax exempt. So in the meantime, uh, I have worked very, with a energy consultant for the last month and we have taken care of that going forward, but now we have to work on getting it taken care of going backwards. Um, reimbursement. 
you know, to get it all reimbursed and taken care of. So we just wanted to start off with a clean slate. It's easier to negotiate from a place of, you know, peace. And instead of thinking, they, they think we owe them money. We, they think we think they should wipe out our balance and we're going to figure out what that number is. And then the attorney is going to look for an agreement. Okay. So okay. it says that the, the understanding is that, it, that we'll try to get a credit for any taxes and fees that should, that we should not have had to pay. Correct. Okay. Any other discussion? Okay, hearing now, Mr. Chernow. Mr. Jones. Mr. Murar. Yes. Mr. Roskus. Yes. Mrs. Zern. Yes. Dr. Yes. Zio. Yes. Passes 5 0. Thank you, Mr. Chernow. Letter F. This is a settlement agreement and release for with the electric company that will remain unnamed. <laughs> um, so this is a very similar situation to what we're going to go through with the gas company and suppliers. Legal counsel stepped in. They fought it. They were more receptive than the gas company was, and they are crediting back all of those late fees and taxes with this settlement agreement. Thank How long were we paying them when we shouldn't have been? I think this one goes back to like 2016 or something. I think it's the last couple pages of the agreement. Okay. Um, but yeah, so these are things that we're just trying to get cleaned no, sure. up and take care of and good. move forward. It's just, just another example of Nick doing a good job and no, finding this stuff. Great. Do I hear a motion to approve item 3F, settlement agreement and release? Mr. President. Yes, Mrs. I make the motion to approve item 3F settlement agreement and release. Thank you, Mrs. Erin. Do I hear a second? Mr. Mr. Merhart. Second the motion. Thank you. Uh, okay. Is there any discussion? Okay, hearing none, Mr. Chanel. Mr. Jones. Mr. Merhart. Yes. Mr. Roskis. Yes. Mrs. Erin. Yes. Dr. Beal. Yes. Yes. Passes 5 0. Letter G. Purchase orders and blanket certificates. Um, under then and now certificates, we have a then and now for Gallagher Company for emergency pairs throughout the district, Lake Health for service on site, then design architecture. This is the final billing for North, South, and Longfellow. Walter Haverfield legal fees for the 2021 school year. Educational Service Center of Northeast Ohio. This is tuition for special ed students for May of 2020. And the Love Insurance Agency. This is the third installment for property and casualty insurance. And then for blanket certificates of 50,000 or more, we have the Brokers Alliance Group of Ohio. This is the DCW group. This is their insurance consulting agreement. Lake Health, this is service on site for August 2020 to June 2021. And miscellaneous vendors, this is tuition for the Excel Tech program. So that's miscellaneous school districts. Letter H, we have transfer of funds. This is the closeout 2020 funds to 2021 funds. Uh, we have the student wellness funds that we did not spend down last year that we will transfer into this year and spend on this year and then the north high class of 2020 into the north high class of 2021 letter i we have a couple adjustments to our student activity budget purpose goals and revisions and those are my items for those will go to the consent calendar. Thank you, Mr. Chernow. Next item uh, on the agenda is item four, the superintendent's question and answers. Okay, thank you, Mr. President. Um, item A is superintendent questions and answers, and we had none submitted. To my knowledge, is that correct? 
Thank you. Uh, and then we did have a um, question come in via email. And uh, essentially what the person is asking for, which I think probably is representative of the board and the community in general is, you know, what's happening with the cases, what are the case numbers, what happens when someone comes off, how do we track that, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, I wanna, I'm gonna walk you through all those numbers, but the first thing that I'm gonna start off with is uh, before I even get into the numbers, which are rising incredibly fast. Uh, they're over the last three or four days, the numbers seem to be over a three or four day period, almost doubling. Um, but so we saw it as we always do consultation from the Lake General Health District and w the Lake General Health District commissioner is Ron Graham. He runs, um, runs that um, organization. And he wrote us a letter, um, Dear Willoughby Eastlake Board of Education, upon review of your student and staff morbidity, frequency, and absentee data, current hospital bed count of COVID-19, admissions to ICU, CCU, rapid increase of COVID-19 cases over the last seven days, the increasing number of COVID-19 cases resulting from community, a slight increase in school-based spread, anticipated rise of new cases over the holidays and rapidly declining capacity for contact tracing. We recommend that Willoughby Eastlake review the trends of cases of COVID-19 during the remainder of the week. If the county continues to see a rise in cases, we would suggest that you take into consideration the CDC's indicators and thresholds for risk introduction and would suggest that our in transmission of COVID-19 in schools, the CDC states that when the number of new cases per 100,000 is greater than 200 districts are that two, and within 200 districts are at the highest risk of transmission in schools. In Lake County, we have passed this benchmark. That being said, it would be advisable to transition all students to virtual learning if the upward trend continues. School districts varying resources and anticipated staff shortages in our schools, hospitals, and community providers indicate the need to return to remote or hybrid learning until the end of the school year. While schools continue to be one of our safer environments, remote learning contributes to reduced risk and at the current time of increasing degree of community spread, we would recommend modifying your current in-person learning. He, Mr. Graham will join us live at 7.30. So just some of the numbers that we we're talking about to give you a sense of what's happening. These are student and staff COVID data from the beginning of the year until now. So from a time period of August 28th when we started school until October 29th, we saw a total number of 24 cases. In a span of about three days, we went from 24 to 33. And then from November 2nd, to November 7th, we went from 33 to 50. And then one day we've gone from 50 to 58. So the number, these are your, our rolling number of cases. How does that correspond with what we're seeing in the community? Again, from August 28th to October 29th, there were 716 cases in the boundaries of our school district in, mul in the multiple communities that make up our school district. Then a few days later, it went to 823, and then in one day it goes to 922. So the numbers are rapidly increasing um, over the last several days. Um, so what's that look like for hospitalizations? Hospitalizations are up for critical care beds. They're up to 84% of critical care beds being used at this point. And probably the most alarming number is the increase of 6% to 48% of pediatric beds. So this notion that it doesn't impact kids isn't based in data. It doesn't impact kids like it might impact um, a 70 year old individual, but it certainly impacts them nonetheless. 
So that's what we're seeing. Um, uh, Ron Graham wrote a letter and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the letter. I'll let him address it, but um, his concern is, and he's, this is the letter he wrote, percentage of ICU beds occupied also increase to a level causing us to reach level four or purple alert level, which is the highest alert level. So he thinks that that's coming. Right now, I believe it is every county in the state, but I know it's every county in Northeast Ohio, is red level H. There's a new indicator in that. H means we're at high risk of moving from red to purple. If you read what purple says, and I believe he quotes it somewhere in his letter, uh, but it, uh, but it, what it says is that um, you should only leave your home for essential purposes. And we are on the verge of transitioning. And if our numbers continue to grow as we've seen them grow over the last several days, uh, eventually we will hit purple. Um, and I'll let Ron Graham speak a little more uh, specifically about what he's seeing and the trends that he's seeing, but um, we're, we're, we're seeing that. Um, I'll let him talk a little bit more about that, but we have made some additional changes to our reopening uh, plan. I would just ask that you take a look at it. It's on our, our district website and there. We also added a section called important guidelines and facts because there is some confusion. You'll see someone that's on a 10 day quarantine and you see someone on a 14 day quarantine and go, what the heck? Why is one person 14 days and one person 10? So let's say for example, that Dr. Beal tests positive tomorrow. I'm in close proximity of Dr. Beal for 15 minutes or more over a 24 hour time period because of our meeting he would be quarantined for 10 days. He's COVID positive. I'm quarantined for 14 days. Why? Because they believe that he's been, before he starts showing symptoms, assuming he started showing symptoms, leaves tonight, he's showing symptoms, goes and gets tested tomorrow. They, they back that up four days that he's been actively, he's been exposed and COVID positive for four days before that manifested into actual symptoms. I have to do a 14 day quarantine because I show no symptoms and this was my first exposure. So that's very confusing to people, but that is the difference between 10 and 14. I've said it before, but Catherine has done a remarkable job of tracking all of this. Um, we do, we've been doing, we consult with the, with the Lake County General Health District for everything that we do, every decision that we make. But contact tracing, they are at this point, they are so overwhelmed with contact tracing that they're pushing it completely down to school districts because they just simply can't keep up. Um, you'll see that school districts all across their area are closing buildings, if not their districts. Um, and they're tumbling like dominoes. Specifically, where are we in our buildings? So if you look at our COVID dashboard, which is updated and it's on our district website, if someone wants to pull it up, current active cases, that means these people are, these people are not quarantined people. Rather, these are people that are COVID positive and they're inside their window of quarantine. We have 23 students, 11 staff members, and 34, so for a total of 34 active cases in the district. While that may seem like a small percentage of our teaching staff, for example, roughly 560 teachers, they touch and our students touch lots of other people. So it causes huge quarantines 
and you ha and we've we're currently closing buildings three right now grand elementary willoughby middle and south high school south high school seems to be in the cycle of constant exposure but we are knocking out swaths of staff every time it happens not to mention students and those folks go into quarantine making it virtually impossible to staff our buildings uh, people get upset because there's late notice we're in, we are notifying the community as fast as we possibly can. You have to understand, we're getting this information at the last minute as well. So people have asked, what about people that have recovered? Well, there's been 19 students, when we say recovered, they have run their quarantine out, they're healthy and they've returned. So we have 19 students, five staff members and 24 total cases. Um, where they've come back. So overall, total district cases to date is 58, but we are, we had our latest update about 6.30 or so. Mrs. Beold, since we last spoke, which was prior to the start of this board meeting, do we have more? Three more since the start of the school board meeting. It's unmanageable. So these numbers that I'm gonna share with you are not updated because I don't even know who these three people are. But at North High School, we have eight students who are active and one staff member. Now the interesting thing about North High School, only one of those students is a brick and mortar student. And that's why you see South North High School still open and that's why you also see North High School not staff being able to come because these have been kids that are virtual who are, for whatever reason, at North High School at becoming COVID positive. So that hasn't affected the staff. Conversely, you look at South and you say they don't look that much different. Eight active students and eight staff members, but those are brick and mortar students versus online students and there's the difference again very confusing to the community they think it's inconsistent but they just they don't know where these kids are you know what the situation is with these kids and and i recognize that's not their fault fault um i do hope that people understand where we are um learning exponentially as we move forward and how to administer a school during a pandemic. Um, they didn't have that class when I did my graduate work. So maybe they will now, I don't know. Uh, NCI, uh, this is NCI Willoughby, one active case. And then you have inexplicably some schools with nothing, the preschool, or at least I say nothing before I know where these three came from. Um, NCI Willoughby, um, East Lake Middle School, none. Soy has one active case. Uh, Willoughby Middle School has two active students and two active staff members. We were knocked out by exposure to staff members and unable to staff the building. Uh, Willowick Middle has no cases. Edison, no cases. Grand Elementary, which we closed, two active students and four staff members. One of those staff members uh, was a staff member, a special staff teacher who saw lots of kids and lots of staff members. And so that was one of impacted a lot of people more so than what maybe a third grade teacher might have impacted. Jefferson, we have one active student, Longfellow, one active staff and Royal View, none. So for whatever reason, Willowick seems to be trending better than some of our other cities. Willowick being hit the hardest. So that's where we are on numbers. Uh, Catherine, is Ron Graham with us? Well, Mr. McKinney is gonna help me here one minute. While we wait for Ron, I think I know 
confident I know what he's going to share with us. And then I wanted him to be able available to answer your questions, whatever questions you may have. Uh, my recommendation is that if we see a trend like this for another day or two, we've informed principals to prepare. We've informed teachers to prepare. We're, we need to get our, our Chromebooks out, our technology out. Uh, to limit to make that transition as smooth as possible but as things are trending right now if they continue to trend this way for another day or two um, I would I would be recommending that we close our schools and my recommendation for closing our schools which is supported by um, in consultation with Ron Graham is till January 15th and where does January 15th come from? January 15th is a quarantine after the holidays are over. That's a 14 day quarantine after the first. I would say this, if the numbers do, if the numbers plateau at the end of November and start to decline, then I would ask um, to return our students if we can do so safely, that I, I think we can review the data, but I also want to give people what I feel and everything that I'm being advised on that is, and I'll let Ron speak to that. Well, actually, this is a good segue. Mr. Graham, can you hear us? Yes, I can. Um, Ron, can you speak to us a little bit about the trends that you're seeing and what you, based on your professional expertise, expect to see over the next through the holidays anyway? Yeah, so, so the main thing we're seeing here is uh, one, general non-compliance with uh, the public on contact tracing. So we have uh, a significant part of the data that we can kind of just guess at what it is. They don't want to tell their neighbor that they were at their party or they were kids at a Halloween party. Um, is anything they can do, we're losing more and more uh, insight through that data. Uh, so we've had an influx of cases here already to, let me get to the page report. Read these and you may or I'm down, but so we looked at cases. So back at the beginning of October 6th, 7th, and 8th, it was a different landscape. We had 10 cases on October 6th, 7 on October 7th, uh, 10 on October 9th. So very single digit numbers. Uh, uh, October 29th, we had 86. November 4th, we had 101. A couple of days later, we have 153. And on um, the 8th, 7th and 8th, we've had over 150, up to as high as 168. So what we know is that this data lags behind because of the testing. So I anticipate, you know, the numbers for the next couple of days, possibly in the 200 mark. Uh, and that's a significant increase if you go back not even a month, then we were at 20 cases or 30 cases. Very concerning. What that means for you guys is that these numbers are gonna really jump and we're already seeing the teachers get uh, impacted only from just general concerns. There's the two weeks of the, the CARES Act they can take. Uh, the majority of schools right now are just losing staff. Um, and what we think is going to happen is these numbers between now and end of the year are likely to double one more time. It's literally putting us at 300 cases per day. Uh, one case to investigate that contact trace that even with the assistance of uh, you know great staff that you have there will be like we're talking you know a day to get through one or two of those calls, phone tag. So there's no way we can even keep up with some of that contact tracing. So what we think is most of these, uh, from the data we have, we worked uh, 10 people over Saturday and Sunday each day to catch up with these cases uh, from 500, 500 to 600 cases. And to get the general sense of where these infections are occurring, where it's spread in a certain community. Uh, we're not seeing a huge spread in the schools. There is some we know that they're asymptomatic. There's some, that's why the teachers are getting picked up a little bit quicker. Um, Cause you just don't know that those cases may be in there. Uh, regardless of the holidays, and the, this is a little bit hard, I can send this information to you, but I have my staff plot holidays over top of it. Usually about 10 days after a holiday, our cases double to triple. So we saw this on Memorial Day. Uh, there was a peak about a week later, 4th of July, there's a peak from 17 to 56 cases, Labor Day, uh, very similar. And then the last one was Halloween. And while most events were pretty safe, 
we were up around 101 just from those events. So the cold weather, uh, kind of mask fatigue, I think the general public is really pushing against continuing the mask, especially as we go into the holidays. Uh, kids could come home from college and get and then be introduced to new individuals uh, that they haven't seen for a month or so or a semester. And we're predicting these numbers to just blossom uh, through that. So given every school is a little different, uh, the level indicated level is nice. We like to I mean, like a guide, but it's just one of many. We have to look at you know transportation, PPE, equipment. Um, the other thing we're very concerned about and why we are making uh, stronger recommendations is that the hospital up until last week had been five cases of COVID, at least with Lake Health, on uh, any given day. So somewhere about five up and down. Uh, they're currently at 22 cases. Uh, and that really puts them in a threshold where they, uh, you know, kind of stand at arms and get ready to do something. You have to move patients to Cleveland Clinic, uh, Metro Health, some of the regional hospitals. Uh, and then the staffing shortage, which is hitting everybody, uh, is that there's not enough nurses anyway. They're going out for travel nursing. Uh, we don't pay enough in public health to get a lot of the nursing staff uh, for our kind of work. Um, but those are going to be the big limiters right now. It's very concerning. Uh, so given all that we know, that these spreads are happening, happening like after sports, after school, not so much in the event, that you're going to run out of teachers, we're going to run out of hospital beds, and we're going to run out of the ability to do timely contact tracing. So after the first 24 hours, there's a declining return on investment for contact tracing. Uh, so having led a committee of 17 health commissioners on Friday to the point that there's individuals getting six and 700 cases a day, they can't, they can't keep up. There's not enough staff. You can't hire and background check them enough. Um, so the learning indicators, we think, to go back to that, while they're not the, the greatest indicators for, for sure are new, uh, we think that this Thursday, we will probably be at the red level, but on the watch list, along with several other counties. The week after that, we fall in the purple, and uh, I think that's where we're going to be. Now, there's schools across the U.S. that could be in these kind of similar situations, um, but but you just kind of have to look at what your situation is in, in Lake County here, what our hospital beds look like, uh, and we're recommending anybody that's willing to, um, you know, go remote should just because that's it's going to be the safest bet. We just these numbers are too big, too fast to to put a stop on there. Um, we have literally no control over closing businesses at this point. You know, so we have uh, the document I sent out to superintendents, kind of giving them a highlight that we're going to purple. We just need everybody to be personally responsible and uh, in, inside go on inside of caution, just because it is, these numbers are more predictable. And we had resources. You know, I'd say stay in. We've been big advocates of keeping these kids safe and in school. And it is a safe environment, but the numbers are just going too too fast, too strong. And um, you know, it would be very concerning if we had schools open after Thanksgiving. Uh, I think given the discussions that we're having, most schools are looking at doing hybrid remote before Thanksgiving and potentially just remote through that until about January 15th there. So we'll re reassess. So that's a lot of drinking from the fire hose kind of thing, but it's really these Numbers are going fast and the spread is getting fast. It's, it's beginning to hit people's families or workers where they haven't seen that before. Uh, so there's a lot more tension out there. We still have not open senior centers. Um, again, I, I, we know some spreads going on. It's not really in the schools, but we have to, to kind of lock up on this one and everybody pull together to get through this uh, better than most. The incident rate, uh, there's a little bit of discussion about that. Everything's a little bit different, but I can find that for you guys. Um, we are probably about 600 cases per 100,000. Right now, when you, when you extrapolate that, we'd be concerned at two or 300. Uh, that's where that is. Uh, there's County, Putnam County, for example, is at 1,200 cases per 100,000. So we're still not as good as we were, but we're still probably, you know, 60% better than everybody else for now. But, you know, tomorrow is another, another story. So I do want to applaud everybody on, on your staff with Steve. Uh, I know we sat back in the summer and kind of threw darts at the wall of what our plans would look like, what could we get accomplished. And we far exceeded um, keeping kids in school longer than we I would have thought, uh, much more safer than we would have thought, much more innovatively. Uh, so I give kudos to everybody, including the board. We're in impossible positions with Steve, the staff, uh, you guys as board members. You know, and uh, we would give it our shot. We had to try to do our best to keep kids in school by this point. 
Um, I had no, no other card to play because being realistic that we got to play safe and we got to buckle down. So I thought I'll just leave it open for any questions you may have. Any questions? Do you have any good news for us? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we were trying. The vaccine should be coming, you know, slowly over time. But I wish I, I really have to scrape the bucket to find good news. You know, except that you know, we've done very, very well, better than most up until now. I think we can continue to kind of be above the curve as long as we work together and uh, you know do what we need to do. And that takes all of you guys working with us together here in public health. I personally want to thank you. I know that you guys have really cooperated a lot with our district and giving us the information that we need and, and getting the information out as quickly as you have and uh, and working with us when we have questions. Yeah, I appreciate it. It's a good partner. So we, we don't always get that, but uh, we're doing pretty, pretty lucky in Lake County. But thank you, guys. I have a question. Uh, how yes. With, with not even knowing how bad the flu season is going to be just with the ordinary flu um how might that make this you know infection curve differently or or so you know because are would somebody say who has the flu might get covid or might get some other condition to free yeah that's of the schools well, go ahead. Yeah, that's a wild card because really right now they're not sure because we haven't been there yet. You know, can you get the flu and COVID at the same time? Uh, there's some testing coming up for a few companies where you can be tested by for RSV, flu, and um, coronavirus or COVID-19. And it just depends how the test kits are commodity now. That's already just as this week as these numbers went up nationally and certainly in Ohio. Uh, we're going back into a testing shortage again. Again, if we can't test, you may have like the surgeries on hold. If we're purple and caseload for CCU, ICUs are up, going to be on hold. Uh, it's going to be very challenging to distinguish the difference between those. In some odd sense, you know, the child might get seasonal influenza and be sicker than COVID-19 because they're getting through COVID-19 relatively asymptomatically. So it's really going to depend on how much testing we have. And when that testing backlogs or becomes a supply shortage or uh, physicians become a shortage because they're sick themselves, we're really going to, it's really going to be is a wild west out there. So the biggest thing we can do is kind of look at our hospital bed count. And uh, I don't think there's anybody in the county uh, from healthcare and any of the hospitals that aren't very nervous about what that's going to look like. Uh, we're hanging our hat on the, you know, maybe the seasonal flu will be a little bit less because of the masking. Well, there's just no guarantee at, at that point. So it's, it's going to be a strain on the families. It's going to be a strain on, you know, the community and certainly our children. So there's no good answer on that one because the science is just too new. Thank you. Yep. Good question. All right. Well, thank you very much, Ron. Appreciate your time. It's been very helpful. Yeah. You as well. All right. Talk and to again, you. follow up uh, with anything you guys need. Please feel free to call me. Uh, Steve, I'm sure has my cell phone information and email, and I'm up quite a bit taking calls, so don't hesitate. I will. I'm set my alarm for about 2.30. I'm going to give you a call. <laughs> I, I, yeah, I guarantee it. Oh, <laughs> Thanks, Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ron. The last piece I want to, to mention that will be, ex not that any of this is what people want to hear, but I have grave concerns about being in a closure where you heard numbers that are doubling and tripling we're seeing our first initial initially we did not see spread in our schools and we're starting to begin to see spread in our schools that we know of and it's mostly centered around athletic or after practice events uh, we currently have our north girls basketball team in quarantine i do not feel if the numbers continue to trend like they do like they are I would suspect, and we'll, we're trying to give our principals in the community some notice. So we'll do the best we can to stay safe over the next few days, but I can't see it going much beyond that. I would have a personal difficult ethical time saying that we can continue athletics under, this, under these current conditions. 
Um, we are, along with some other conferences, seeking options for our kids. For example, a uh, delayed winter schedule that might start contests in February and go to March and condense the season. Perhaps by, uh, you know, there are, there's some news that Pfizer, for example, may have a vaccine that might be ready to be out in the public within the next 30 days. You know, who knows how long that would take to actually make a difference, make an impact in terms of distribution of that vaccine, but it's certainly promising, but hard to say that we, we don't have the data to back up that the spread isn't happening in athletics. So I, again, I know that will be a very unpopular choice, but I believe it is the safe choice and believe it is the right choice. But of course I would want your support in doing so. And of course all the winter sports are indoors, so. Further exasperating it. Yeah. And they're close to contact sports like a lot of sports, you know, mm -hmm. basketball. I don't know that you could get more close contact than wrestling. Uh, some are a little less dangerous than others, but at least most of our fall sports were all outdoor open air. Mm -hmm. And our count numbers were significantly lower than what they are today. So I think it would be very hard to be able to safe, to say to the community that we can safely conduct athletics. And I know that's that's a really difficult pill for a lot of families and a lot of kids to swallow. That's all well, I have. Okay, on that unhappy note, um, the next item up for our uh, consideration are the superintendent's resolutions. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. The first item for your consideration is a WIDA memorandum of agreement. This is with our sale program and NCI. Um, it is a normal process where they're closed out of some of their contractual agreements and they're compensated for those and that's not um, unique. Okay. Uh, that's a vote. Yes, do I hear a motion to approve item 5A, WIDA memorandum of agreement? Yes, Mr. Marker. I have a motion to approve item 5A. Thank you, Mr. Marker. Do I hear a second? Mr. Roskus? I will second the motion. Thank you, Mr. Roskus. Is there any discussion? Watch for Mr. Jones. No? Okay. Uh, Mr. Trinella? Mr. Jones? Mr. Murar? Yes. 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 Mrs. Dern? Yes. Dr. Beal? Yes. Passes 5-0. Mr. Thompson? Thank you, Mr. President. Item B for your consideration is a WECP memorandum of agreement for a temporary reduction in force. Remember, please note that these are temporary layoffs and they are layoffs due to COVID-19 if in fact uh, the inevitable transpires as I believe it will uh, this week. Do I hear a motion to approve item 5B, WECP Memorandum of Agreement? Mr. President. Mr. Marker? I'll make a motion to approve item 5B. Thank you, Mr. Marker. Do I hear a second? I will second the motion. Thank you, Mrs. Zurn. Is there any discussion? Okay, hearing none, Mr. Chernell? Mr. Jones? Mr. Murrar? Yes. Yes. Mr. Roskus? Yes. Mrs. Zurin? Yes. Dr. Beal? Yes. Passes 5 0. Mr. Thompson? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Item C for your consideration is an administrative and exempt employee compensation plan and schedule of benefits. Again, this is what we're required to send in to um, STRS. And there, was, there were a few folks that didn't make the original list. That's why you're seeing it again. Thank you. Do I hear a motion to approve item 5C, Administrative and Exempt Employee Compensation Plan and Schedule of Benefits? Mr. President, I will make a motion to approve item 5C. Thank you, Mr. Oskis. Do I hear a second? 
Mr. Murhart? I'll second the motion. Thank you, Mr. Murhart. Is there any discussion? No. Uh, Mr. Chinella? Mr. Jones? Mr. Murrar? Yes. Mr. Roskis? Yes. Mrs. Zurin? Yes. Dr. Beal? Yes. Passes 5 0. Yes. Mr. Thompson? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Item D for your consideration is special service agreements. These are agreements that we've had in place for multiple years. Uh, there are occasions when a student needs uh, exceed what we offer in our district or what works for the parent. And in this case, um, this is with the mentor care, mental car, excuse me, mentor cardinal autism resource and education school. That is part of the consent agenda. Item E for your consideration is a parent guardian transportation agreement. This is a something very common you see across the state when it is impractical for transportation, we pay parents in lieu of. Item F for your consideration is adoption of policy 6144 investments. Um, slight change coming out of I believe Treasurer's Department weighed in on that. Uh, again, Mr. Murphy does a great job. Are you paying attention, Mr. Murphy? I have all along, yeah. Okay. <laughs> Wasn't sure if you were reading or sleeping, so <laughs> just wanted to make sure. So Mr. Murphy does a great job with these policies and keeping us all up to date. Item G for your consideration is the personnel agenda. All the folks that appear on that personnel agenda have been uh, or will be vetted through uh, the Bureau of Criminal Identification and Investigation, the Ohio Department of Education and the Federal Bureau of Investigation before they become permanent employees of Willoughby East Lake City Schools. Okay, do I hear a motion to approve item 5G personnel agenda? Mr. President. Yes, Mrs. Er. I make the motion to approve item 5G personnel agenda. Thank you, Mrs. Erin. Do I hear a second? Mr. Murhar. I'll second the motion. Thank you, Mr. Murhar. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Charnala? Mr. Jones? <laughs> Mr. Murrah? Yes. Mr. Roskis? Yes. Mrs. Zurn? Yes. Dr. Beal? Yes. Yes. Passes 5 0. Mr. Thompson? Um, final agenda item is uh, was an item that was in the personnel agenda removed for, um, for Mr. Murhart to abstain. Mm -hmm. And it is approval of a professional development instructor stipend for. Uh, Leah Murhar. Do I hear a motion to approve item 5H? Mr. President, Mr. Roskis. I make a motion to approve item 5H. Thank you, Mr. Roskis. Do I hear a second? Mr. President, I will second. Thank you, Mrs. Ernie. Do I hear any discussion? Okay, hearing none. Mr. Chinella? Mr. Jones? Mr. Murhar? Abstain. Mr. Roskis? Yes. Mrs. Zurn? Yes. Dr. Beal? Yes. Passes 4 0. Yes. Mr. Thompson? Like, um, under other business, there's superintendent policies. These are first readings, and it's policy 6114, uh, cost principal spending of federal funds, and policy 6325, procurement federal grants and funds. So you'll have some leisure reading this evening if you'd like to tackle that. Yes. But only two of them, right, Mr. Murphy? That's correct, they're a special update. Yeah, very nicely done. And that, of course, needs no action today. Correct. Uh, next item is meeting notification. I'd like to notify everyone of the next meeting of the Willoughby East Lake Schools Board of Education on December 14th at 7 p.m. here at the Willoughby East Lake Board of Education building. Uh, we'll have to send a notice out if that becomes a virtual meeting. Um, but uh, at its, this time, it's, it's scheduled as a public meeting. And uh, item 8A is adoption of the consent calendar. Do I hear a motion to uh, adopt the consent calendar? 
Mr. President. Yes, Mrs. Zarko. I make the motion to adopt item 8A, adoption of the consent calendar. Thank you, Mrs. Zarin. Do I hear a second? No, Mr. Second motion. Thank you, Mr. Mahar. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, Mr. Chernella. Mr. Jones. Mr. Murhar. Yes. Mr. Roskis. Yes. Mrs. Zurin. Yes. Dr. Beal. Yes. Passes 5 0. Yes. Thank you very much. Do I hear a motion to adjourn? Mr. Murhar. I make a motion to adjourn. Thank you, Mr. Murhar. Do we hear a second? Mr. Roskis. Mr. President, I will second the motion. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Once again, hearing none, Mr. Chanel. Mr. Jones. Mr. Murar. Yes. Mr. Roskis. Yes. Mrs. Zarin. Yes. Dr. Beal. Yes. You're adjourned at 7.56. Yes. Thank you very much.